<clears throat> Please join me in prayer. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on this place. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, this week has been full of lots of words. Words in the news, words in my news feed, words from protesters, words from statements, words, words, words. To take a break from these many words, I want to invite all of us to slow down and come and look at an image. The image is actually an icon and icons aren't simply works of art, they are sacred. In parts of Eastern Christian tradition, for example, icons are understood as windows into heaven. To Father James Martin, an American Jesuit priest, icons are invitations to prayer. And to Photios Contelugus, a renowned modern Greek iconographer, Icons raise the soul and mind of the believer who sees the icon to the realm of the spirit, of the incorruptible, of the kingdom of God, as far as can be achieved with material means. Now, for many Protestant Christians, icons and the veneration of Mary are unfamiliar, but they offer us the opportunity to join with Christians all around the world in this ancient and sacred practice which transports all of us beyond words when seeking God. Whether this is new to you or you have an icon beside you at home this morning, let us all set aside words for a moment and be transported into prayer and into the realm of spirit with the icon we are about to view. The icon I'm about to show you was written or created by Mark Dukes after much prayer, study, and artistry. It was commissioned by the Reverend Dr. Mark Buzuti Jones of Trinity Church Wall Street, and it still hangs at Trinity Church in New York City for all to come and see. The icon is called Our Lady of Ferguson and All Those Killed by Gun Violence. I'm about to put it up on the screen, and as I do, I invite you to just take a breath. Let us enter into a prayerful state as we take in this icon. I invite you to consider what do you see and what do you notice? I see Mary mother of God, depicted as a black woman. As she gazes at me and at us, I notice her hands raised, palms up and out, in the traditional Oran's position of prayer and supplication. They, like Mary's, below her hands, as if in her womb, is the figure of a person, could be a young boy, with his hands raised. They, like Mary's hands, are open as if in the Iran's position of prayer, but they're also raised further, bringing forth for me the chants of protesters, hands up, don't shoot. Echoing the cries of the black men, women, and trans folks killed at the hands of police officers and white supremacy. The crosshairs of a gun, which bring forth the imagery and violence of the cross, are centered on the body, where a heart depicted in the imagery of the sacred heart of Jesus, a deeply meaningful and ancient image of Christ's heart, is surrounded by thorns, and yet still is shining as if blazing by a holy resurrecting fire. To the boys left and right are the Greek letters C and V, symbolizing Christus Victor, which speaks to Christ's ultimate victory over suffering and death. 
the image surpassing human suffering to Christ's suffering and Christ's victory over death and violence. What do you see? For what do you feel invited to pray? I invite each of us now to pray. Maybe words will come to you as you gaze at the icon. Maybe they do not, no need to force them. But let's all dwell with the sacred icon and indeed dwell with God. As you wish, I invite you to pause the worship video and continue in prayer on your own. Let us continue. For me, when I pray with this icon, I hear Christ's words in Matthew 25, telling the parable of the sheep and goats in which the king teaches, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to me. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did to the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. You see why family, we are living in a sacred spiritual time of unrest. Both COVID-19 with its heavy impact on the marginalized in our country and in the world, and the cries in the streets over police brutality and violence against the black community speak to the insidious individual and systemic racism that has plagued our nation since its very inception. In Genesis 1, our assigned reading for today, we are reminded of our origins, origin story. And oftentimes we have to go back to the beginning to know the way forward. And in the beginning, in our beginning, God created, and it was good. And all of creation became interconnected, bound together. The bees' well-being interwoven with the flowers, the trees with the air, and the air with life itself. And humanity was created in the image of God, bound to one another, to God, and to all of creation with capacities and responsibilities for great stewardship and care. Yet though this is our origin, God's creation today is suffering. As we separated from one another, and from creation, our sin grew and began to have inhabit not only individual action and inaction, but even the institutions we built and the societal norms we began to accept. Yet amidst all this, Christ came to earth, and the Spirit, our advocate and friend, also came and spoke and still speaks today. And like the great wind and fire of Pentecost, when the spirit filled the room and the nation spoke, black life today is being voiced. Black pain and suffering, black art and authorship, black joy and solidarity, black life is speaking today. And like a great wind, the spirit of God, Christ among us and before us is speaking too. Now to the non-Black Christians like myself who are here for worship this morning, I sense an invitation to resist looking away as all is being spoken. For generations, we have gotten stuck in denial or guilt. It's much easier to believe that the world is just than to see injustice and to look for it in oneself, in one's community, in one's world. 
But God didn't send God's son to come to earth because humanity was living in justice, because humanity was living as if justice and peace were real. God sent God's son to tend to humanity's sin and brokenness, to heal the sick and needy, and to liberate us all to the interconnected, bountiful life God creates and desires for us, a life of stewardship and peace, a life of tending to the land and tending to one another. What might practicing this tending, especially in this moment, this protecting of Black life, look like for you in this world? How might white supremacy and racism be uprooted and uplearned within ourselves and within our communities? The body of Christ is diverse, and the gifts that Christ has given each of us and called each of us to is equally diverse. What are you being called to give, to care for creation, to care for Black life? And what are you being called, what are we being called to shed and let go of? These are sacred questions, questions I believe Jesus intended even for his disciples when he commissioned them to go forth to all the nations, to baptize and walk the ways of Christ, leaving behind all that is not of Christ, and stepping forward wherever the Spirit is led. In the days and months and years ahead, let us listen past our own language as they did on Pentecost Day. Let us listen to our Black siblings who are speaking and have been speaking as if we are in a never-ending Pentecost Day where the spirit, spirit is seeking to move our hearing to understanding, to action, and to liberation. Indeed, let us listen to our Black siblings as if we are listening to Christ himself. For when pain is voiced, Christ is calling out in it. When oppression is present, Christ is in the crosshairs. When tears are shed, Christ too is weeping. When anger is voiced, Christ's righteousness, anger swells healing humanity from pain internalized to a naming of justice externalized. And when joy and healing occur, Christ is rejoicing. To the non-Black siblings like myself who are here today, let us listen and be transformed by the wind that is moving through our country. And now to the Black Christians who are listening this morning. May you know the sacred arms in which you are held. May you remember that it is our triune God who has the whole world in his hands. May you feel Christ who is walking with you in the good and in the bad. May you feel the spirit who amplifies the divine image of God planted deep within you at work. May you feel the tenderness of Mary, Christ's mother, who is tending to all her children. And may you embrace the invitation from God to rest and honor the Sabbath. There will always be more to do and say, but it is not all on you. God's breath and the Spirit's wind and Christ's voice go before you. For right now, a holy wind is blowing, blowing through our country. And this wind is not driven by your singular voices and witness, but instead it is by God's liberating breath, exhaling through all of creation. Like on the first day creation came to be, and like on the last day Christ lived on earth, all of us, people of color and white people alike, are bound to one another. As Mark Miller writes in his hymn, The Handiwork of God, we are stitched together piece by piece, sewn with purpose and with care. Scraps once, once thought to have no worth now become a sacred treasure. A quilt of love made by holy hands, every pattern known by heart stitched together by the sower of our souls, 
a quilt of love, a work of art. We are the handiwork of God. Let us each be this handiwork and bear the divine image of God, which is planted deep within. And let us trust that indeed all of us are not on this journey alone. For our triune God is always creating, always sustaining, and always redeeming. And the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, one mother of us all, goes with us always. Amen.